Well, good morning, Crossing Church. How are you doing today? You doing good? I hope you are. I'm doing good. It is always good to be with you. It is always good to be in the house of the Lord with the people of the Lord in the word of the Lord together. And I'll tell you one of the greatest things about being with all of you is that this is like the, uh, this is like the locker room talk before we go out and play the game. And, uh, and, and, you know, we are the children of the Great Commission and we go out into this world. And it is just an amazing thought to think that every week we just get to unleash thousands upon our communities and they get to hear God through your testimony and through the way that you live your lives. And you can see that every week people are being affected by that and God's winning battles. And it's just awesome to be able to know that God is doing that great, incredible thing, and he's doing it through all of you. So I want to welcome all of you from uh, all over this region, all of our locations in three states, and uh, also those of you that are online and inside. So thankful for each and every one of you, as well as we continue in this series of But Now I See. So many things that we learn that we begin to perceive and understand as we develop or walk in this relationship with Jesus Christ that's intimate and personal. And today I want to kind of open up with a story about two guys named Mike and Kevin. Now Mike and Kevin were two guys that back in 2010 thought it would really be cool to share their personal pictures and videos on the web. And there was, a, there was this brand new thing that was happening called apps. And so they decided to create this app where we could share pictures and videos. And so, you know, all of you that have seen pictures of people's cats and the food they're eating for lunch, you can thank Mike and Kevin because in two years, they, they launched it in 2010, and in two years, they had over 100 million downloads of that app. And so Mark Zuckerberg calls them and says, hey, I want to buy your app, the head of Facebook. And they're like, well, what, do you, what would you give us for it? He goes, how about a billion dollars? So Mike and Kevin, in two years, made $500 million apiece. Pretty good, huh, for two years' work? And that's the story of Instagram. It also helps us to understand something that's become a relatively new phenomena in our culture. And it's this word that has come into our vocabulary. And the word is viral. You know, people have been talking for the last 10 or 15 years about things that go viral. And it's been associated with social media. It's been associated with the internet. And that's been a really, really positive word right up until 2020. And then all of a sudden, 2020 comes along, and that word finds itself in a completely new context, which is actually its original context, because the virus is spreading exponentially until it covers the entire globe. And before that, nobody, nobody, I don't know, maybe a few of you had heard of a place called Wuhan, China, but now there's nobody that hasn't heard of a place called Wuhan, China. So I was thinking about this as I'm preparing uh, to speak to you today, and I found out something about viruses, that viruses weren't discovered until 1892. So they're 120 years old, you know, something like that. Uh, but what's interesting is that even though viruses were discovered in 1892, the vaccines for viruses were actually discovered 100 years before viruses were discovered. How can you discover a vaccine for a virus when you don't even know there's a, such a thing as a virus? But it's true is that the first vaccine was developed in 1798 for smallpox, nearly 100 years before scientists figured out there was something called a virus. I think that's interesting because we discovered a cure before we even knew what the problem was. 
And that really resonated with me because I was thinking that same reality is true for us today when we come into an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ, that we actually discover the cure before we have a real understanding of what the problem is. The problem is we, we have this intimate relationship with Jesus, and then we start understanding our na- the nature of our problem with God and what that problem has done to us. You know, Jesus understood this. Of course, he understands about everything, right? So he understood about viruses, and he actually talks about viral things, 2,000 years ago, we would never have labeled it that, but that's what he talks about, this viral power, this incredible viral power. And he was talking about it in reference to the gospel, the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God and the gospel and how it has viral power to change the nature of a person and to change the nature of the world. He taught us about this viral power in stories or You might say illustrations that have a particular point attached to them. And the Bible refers to these stories as illustrations with a particular point attached to them. Uses this word, it uses the word parable. Jesus told them this parable, this story, this illustration. Well, I want to refer to some of those uh, illustrations or parables in Matthew chapter 13. There's three that... I want us to look at. The first one is in verse 31 and 32. And see if you can see what I see. And that's the viral power, okay? So Jesus talks about a mustard seed. He says this in verse 31. Jesus told them another parable. There's that word. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. And though it is the smallest of all seeds... Yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. Now, some of you might say, well, you know, actually, Jerry, the mustard seed is not the smallest seed. And I would say, yes, I know that, that uh, actually the orchid seed is probably the smallest seed. But what Jesus is talking about is what farmers would use. Of all the seeds farmers would use, This would be the smallest seed. But that's not really the point. The point is in its reproductive ability. So a mustard plant can grow up to 12 feet tall, and it produces seed pods, and each seed pod has three seeds in it. All right? So average mustard plant, when it's fully grown, will reproduce itself 120 to 240 times. Do you like deviled eggs? How many of you like deviled eggs? It's like, give me some of that, right? Do you, do, do, do you put the, what's it, paprika? Is that what it, what's that red stuff? Are you, how many of you are paprika people? Yeah, okay. It's like not a deviled egg unless you do that. Some of you are like, no, I don't need that. I don't need that. How many of you like potato salad? Yeah, yeah. How many of you like a great ballpark hot dog with mustard on it? How many of you just want ketchup? You need to leave right now. (laughs) Out of here. Just kidding. You like something to dip a pretzel in? If it isn't cheese, mustard's pretty good, right? Are you thankful for that? I'm thankful for mustard. And, and, And the thing is, is it something that reproduces at this level that is dynamic and exponential, you could say, viral, That's one of the stories Jesus told. Another one was in the 33rd verse, and he talks about yeast and a lump of dough. It says, he told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked its way all through the dough, right? Okay, so the latest translations of the Bible actually say 60 pounds. But the ones that I usually study out of are a little earlier translations I'm comfortable with. And it doesn't say that. It says three measures of flour. So when I read three measures of flour, I'm thinking like three cups of flour. So like what is them? So like I, I don't have, I don't know all of the Jewish measurements, like what a siah is and what an ephah is. And, 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 but a measure isn't a cup. It's 20 pounds. 
How many of you ladies, gentlemen, bakers, consider yourself bakers, when you're making bread, you work with 60 pounds of flour? Wow. Like, no. I mean, I don't know how many loaves of bread, 60 pounds of flour would actually make. But the point isn't that. The point is just a tiny little bit of yeast has that much impact on this huge amount of dough or flour. And you know what that means? It's dynamic. It's exponential. It's viral. And what Jesus is saying is the kingdom of heaven or the gospel is like that. It has this power. If you go to the beginning of the chapter, Jesus tells this very famous story about a sower who's uh, sowing seed. He's actually broadcasting seed. So he's kind of indiscriminately throwing the seed. And as he's telling the story, he says, some of the seed fell on a path and the birds came and got it because it didn't have an opportunity to root. And then some of the seed fell in rocks and because There was very little soil there. It sprung up and then it just died out because it was scorched. And then some of it fell among thorns, but the thorns were taking all the nutrition from the soil. And so it was choked out. But then some of it fell on good soil. And it grew and it took root and it produced a harvest. And in verse 8, it says, Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop. And he says this, 160 or 30 times what was sown. What's he saying? It's dynamic. It's exponential. It's viral. And he's talking about the kingdom of heaven or the gospel, the message of the good news. That's how powerful the gospel is when it's released. It is in the nature of the gospel because the gospel is infused with the nature of God. And the nature of God is love. And God's love is designed to reach everyone because God loves everyone. And so it's in the nature of the gospel to expand dynamically, exponentially, virally. Now, how does that apply to you? And how does that apply to me? Well, it's wrapped up in this moment that we come into an intimate personal relationship with Jesus. See, we've we've heard this message that Jesus loves us to the fullest extent of his love, to the point that he would literally lay down his life for us on a cross of all things, showing us that extent. And he pays our debt in full. That's what Jesus said on the cross He said tetelestai, which is translated, it is finished, but actually means paid in full. This debt we all owe for all of the sins that we've committed. And when we believe in him and start the process of turning toward him and turning from our former life and being baptized, we step out of death and we step into life. But what kind of a life? What do I do now? What is my purpose? A lot of us are asking that question. God, what what is your will for my life? What's my purpose in life? Well, Jesus answers that question. He answers this question in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. This is what it says. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore... Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now, this scripture that I just read for you is commonly referred to as the Great Commission. Now, I want us to think about that word, commission. Okay. If we break this down, many times we want to skip over the first part of this and we want to go right into the go and make disciples. But that first line is so critical where he says, all authority has been given to me on in heaven and on earth because authority is the foundation upon which the great commission stands. Jesus is saying, I have authority to commission you. 
Like in the military, if you're going, if you become an officer, you receive a commission. And it's what you're supposed to go do. When we come into a relationship with Jesus, we're not just taking him as our savior, are we? You hear people get in the baptistry, and when they get into the baptistry, they repeat the good confession. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and I want him as my personal... That's exactly right. My personal Lord and Savior. Well, the word Lord there is an authority word, isn't it? It means I am relinquishing authority and I'm giving that authority to him. So he has the authority to commission me. He has authority to tell me this is what I want you to do. You ask, what is God's will for my life? He just answered it in Matthew 28. We're submitting to that authority. And with that, he commissions you. And it's with these next words, right? Go, right? Preach the gospel, all nations, baptizing them, name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you, right? So I can read that and I can miss what's going on. I think, you know, you look at it like I do and it's like, well, it says I've got to go somewhere. I've got to make disciples and I've got to baptize people and I've got to teach People And that's true, kind of true. But the actual object of the commission isn't all those things. It's one thing, and that is make disciples. Because in the, the original language of Greek, the object of the sentence is make disciples. And then there are three participles that, that modify making disciples. And it's to go, baptize, and teach. And if you guys remember from English class, whenever that was, that a lot of times they have an ending on in the word, and the ending is an I-N-G, going, baptizing, teaching, right? Those are the endings of participles. And it goes one step further than that. A disciple is made when we go and when we baptize and when we teach. But there's something even di- deeper here that's understood. It's in present active which means not just going, it means as you go, as you baptize, as you teach. It means that this is supposed to be just what you do. In every day, in every moment of your life, you're living intentionally in this relationship with God where God is going to give you opportunities as you walk through life, as you go, right? And how many of you are going, by the way, like all the time? Like someone says, how you doing? It's like, I'm just going and going and going. Like we're going all the time, right? So check one off. I'm doing that. If I'm living intentionally in the Great Commission, it means I'm going and you're already going. The other part is baptizing and teaching, which means that I'm ready at a moment's notice, whether I'm at the store or I'm at the restaurant or I'm filling my car up with gas or I'm at a school board meeting, or I am always ready to talk to somebody else about my relationship with the Lord and the relationship they can have with the Lord because I'm living in the intentionality of the Great Commission. When I do that, it is in the nature of the gospel to go viral and it will take over. When we live with that type of intentionality, then God will deploy us into all sorts of circumstances where his gospel will reproduce in miraculous ways. That is what God's will is for your life, to live in the intentionality of the Great Commission. Now, I need to give you an illustration of that, and I'm going to give you one from Acts 10 and Acts 11, all right? And it's about Simon Peter. So Simon Peter goes to stay at a friend's house in a town called Joppa, which is a seacoast town in southern Israel. And uh, the Bible says that the, uh, the guy's name is Simon that, that owns this house. And of course, you know, we call Simon Peter, Simon Peter, because Jesus gave him the name Peter. Well, this guy's name is Simon, but it's Simon the Tanner, which means it's connected to his occupation. Do you know what a tanner is? A tanner is a person who skins animals and turns their hide into leather. 
I don't know if any of you have ever been around a tanner or around a place that does tanning, but it just flat stinks. It is one of the stinkiest places you can ever be. So I would imagine that Simon probably had lots of room in his house because people weren't lining up to stay at his house because he's Simon the Tanner, right? So it's interesting when I read this story about Peter at the house of Simon the Tanner that it says what it says in verse 9 and 10. It says, About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. Why do you, why do you think he went up on the roof? Maybe it was because it was the house of Simon the Tanner. And since it was a seacoast town, at least he could get some fresh air. Because it stunk, right? And then it says in verse 10, which is really funny, he became hungry. Which means probably when he was down in the living room, he wasn't getting hungry. Because it was so awful down there. But after, when he got in the fresh air of the roof, he became hungry and he wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Now, understand this. He's already living in the intentionality of the Great Commission because that's just what Simon Peter did. Every opportunity he get, he would share the message of Jesus Christ. Got him into a lot of trouble early on. Got him executed eventually, but he always wanted to share what Jesus had done for him, live in the intentionality of the Great Commission. So when this story unfolds and God speaks to him, something interesting happens. So let me just tell you what happened. So in this trance, he sees, like a vision, he sees this, it was like a sheet being held by its four corners, and it's lowered from heaven to earth, and then Simon Peter can see what is contained inside that, and it's all kinds of animals, and Some of them are clean and some of them are unclean. And what that means in Jewish literature is some of them are fit to eat and some of them are not fit to eat. You're not allowed to uh, eat those, right? And understand this about Simon Peter. He is a true blue Jew. Uh, He was born that way. He was raised that way. And he lived according to Jewish laws and customs. And so he was not going to violate violate that. He was a very religious man from a Jewish standpoint. And up to this moment in the Bible, the only people that he would share the message of Jesus would be Jewish people. Because Jewish people did not associate with any Gentiles. They wouldn't walk with them. They wouldn't help them. They wouldn't have a conversation with them. And they certainly would not go into any of their houses. So this sheet comes down, and this voice comes from heaven and says to Simon Peter, Simon, get up, kill, and eat. And Simon Peter says, not so, Lord. Nothing unclean has ever entered my mouth. And then God says to him, what God has declared to be clean, don't call it unclean. And that happens three times. And at the end of the third time, he comes out of this trance, and he kind of does because there's a knock on the door, right? And, and, And he's wondering what that is, this sound at the door. And this is what it says in verse 19 of Acts 10. It says, while Peter was still thinking about this vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Now, those people that are at the door are people from the house of Cornelius in Caesarea. Caesarea is a seacoast town quite a bit north of Joppa. And uh, Cornelius just happens to be a Gentile. And all of his friends are Gentile. And his family is Gentile. And the people at the door are Gentiles. So understand... Peter has all these internal obstacles now. I don't talk to Gentiles. I don't go with Gentiles. I certainly don't enter the house of a Gentile, and I don't eat with Gentiles. I don't have anything to do with that. And here are these people at the door, and God has just spoken to me, and he said, what I've declared clean, don't call it unclean, and go with these people. Do you know what this was? This was a calling. 
Now, there's a difference between a commission and a call. Commissioning is what you live in every day. But inside that commission, God will speak to you with specific callings. Now, in verse 44 and 45, it tells you what actually happens. So Peter goes with these guys, and he's got to be freaking out because he's way outside of his comfort zone. And I imagine when he steps over the threshold of that house, he's like, what am I doing? And this house is full of people, and they're all Gentiles. And he's getting their cooties on him. You know, he's like, ah. And he starts to preach because God told him to preach. And this happens. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on those who heard the message The circumcised believers or the Jews who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Wow, we are all under authority, the authority of Jesus to live in the commission, which is what Simon Peter was doing. But it is inside that commission that Jesus will call you to specific tasks. Listen to me, but you can't be called into those experiences unless you are living in the commission. Because if you're not living in the commission, you can't hear him. And what those specific callings will do, they will stretch you out like you would not believe. They'll get into your internal obstacles and they'll begin to give your life meaning. Now, listen to this. When Peter looked back on his life, because when he's an old man, he's going to be crucified upside down in Rome. And when he looked back on his life, this had to be one of his greatest moments, one of his greatest joys, because God used him to be the first person to share the gospel with the rest of the world, the Gentile world. And you know, Matt, just about all of you here and all our locations are Gentiles. And it all goes back to this moment. This was the first one because he was the first to follow the Lord when he said, you'll be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And the ends of the earth began in Caesarea in a Roman's house named Cornelius with his friends and family. And the ripples from that moment reaches across time and space until it reaches me and it reaches you. Now, Jesus didn't say he wanted them to be his witnesses. He said they would be because he has authority to say that over our lives. Peter just discovered what his Savior had always known because he was walking in the commission. He was available for his calling. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you think that Simon Peter was like totally ready for this? Do you think that Simon Peter had all of the gifting that was necessary to go reach a bunch of Gentiles? He'd never been with Gentiles. He, had, he, he was completely ignorant to this. And here's the point I want to make. God wasn't looking for Simon Peter's ability. And he isn't looking for your ability because he will provide you what, with whatever ability you need when he calls you to something. He's looking for your availability. He's looking for your availability as you go, as you baptize, as you teach, while you make disciples, because you're living in the intentionality of your commission. Now, sometimes in life, you get the opportunity to see at least a part of the results of the commission you're living out and the benefits of the callings that God has given you in life. But I guarantee you, this will be one of the greatest moments in heaven when God shows you, because even though you might forget about a moment or you had no knowledge of what that moment did, God someday is going to show you what he did with what you gave him, with your availability. When I first got into ministry, My first ministry was in Florida. First full-time ministry was in Florida. And Allison and I were newlyweds. And we had the opportunity to go to a a conference, a youth conference. Uh, I was at Cypress Gardens. I remember where it was. And there was a guy speaking that was very well known at the time named Les Christie. And he gave a message. I don't remember at all what it was. 
except for the end and the illustration he gave. And the illustration he gave at the end just stuck with me. And it has all these years, like almost 40 years. I mean, I never forgot it. And this is what he said. He said that there was a friend of his who had a dream. And in that dream, he went to heaven. And you've heard people who have dreams and they go to heaven, right? But he had this dream and he went to heaven. And he said he was overcome with joy because the first person that he saw was Jesus. And he's walking up to the gates of heaven and he's looking forward to going in and Jesus greets him there and he's overwhelmed with joy. And in the overwhelming joy that he's experiencing, Jesus says, hold on, I want to show you something. Like, and you can tell that Jesus is excited to show him this. And he reaches behind a curtain and he starts pulling something out. And it's a, it's huge. It's this huge piece of artwork and he pulls it out to show him. And it just unfolds before him. And what it is, it's a charcoal drawing. You know what a charcoal drawing is, right? Where it has all the blacks and whites and various shades of gray. And and you can just do beautiful artwork with that, right? And, And he goes, look, look. And so this person who's having this dream looks. And what Jesus has done is he has depicted every moment in this man's life where he was living his calling and and living in the intentionality of his commission. And and there are like these scenes, like scenes from his life, and they're captured in this beautiful artwork. And he's looking, and there's some that he didn't even remember. There's some that, oh, yeah, and this was connected to this. And it's this beautiful, beautiful representation of his life and all the places where he gave God the glory, all these places where he was available to God, and God worked through him to do this incredible thing. And he didn't know what to say. He was overcome with joy, and he said, thank you so much. Thank you. This is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I I can't believe that you took such great care, and and every detail is just just perfectly portrayed in this piece of art. And, and, And he was excited about it, and he's getting ready to walk, you know, now on into heaven. And Jesus goes, hold on, hold on. I have something else I want to show you. And he goes back to the curtain and he puts his hands on something and he begins to pull something else out in front of that charcoal artwork. And it's five times the size of what he'd pulled out. And instead of being on paper, it's on canvas. And instead of it being charcoal, it's in oils. And the colors are vivid and they're brilliant and they leap off the page and this, 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 off the canvas, this guy's looking at this and he's seeing all those same scenes, but they're in this vivid color, but it's so much bigger. There are all these other scenes. And as he looks, he's confused because he doesn't remember that. And I certainly would have remembered that. And when did that happen? And when did this happen? And when did that? And and he's trying to make sense of all this. And Jesus looks at him and he says, what? This is what I could have done in your life. If you would have made me the Lord of every moment. And in the story, Les Christie said his friend in this dream began to weep uncontrollably. And that was when Jesus wiped all the tears from his eyes. Hit me. That illustration hit me. It still hits me today. I've told it many times. I've heard it from others many times but it still hits me today because I look back at my life just like you look back at yours and you know what you see. You see what I see. You see all the times I could have stood up. I could have stood out. I could have spoken up. I could have done more. I could have gone further. I could have listened. I, I, I could have toned out the world and toned in the Lord, you know, tuned into the Lord. I could have done that, but I didn't do it. And I realized that in my rearview mirror, there are a lot of regrets. There's a lot of stories that could have been told that were never told. But you know what? Ever since that moment, I thought, you know, I want to minimize that. 
I don't want that to happen in my life. I want to take advantage of every moment because every moment needs to be under the ownership of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I need to live in that commission and I want to listen for those callings because of the viral nature of the gospel. Because I was blind, but now I see. We're moving to a time of decision.